What a beautiful day we have to assemble. And we're so thankful that each of you are here this morning as we celebrate our nation's <clears throat> birthday. We should always give thanks for the freedom we have to assemble, and to worship without any fear. And we're thankful our forefathers had the, uh, the knowledge and the understanding of what it took to be a Christian nation. And we pray and hope that our nation will return to those precepts as we go forward. But this morning we're thankful that we have the opportunity to worship and we're thankful you're here. Visitors, we, I saw uh, several come in and we're thankful this morning that, that you have come to worship with us and we invite you to come back and worship any opportunity that is convenient to your schedule. Also that to those who are not able to be with us and continue to worship at home, we thank you for watching. And we know that your spiritual needs will be fulfilled for having watched us, but we are hopeful that eventually that this virus will pass and you too will uh, be able to worship with us. And to our members, always good to see each of you this morning. Uh, and we are thankful that we are well enough and have chosen to be here this morning. We follow this worship service with a Bible study period at 1015. We will assemble this evening at 6 o'clock for our evening worship, and we assemble on Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock for our Bible study and devotional period. Our scripture this morning will be taken from Luke, the 16th chapter, <clears throat> verses 23 through 24, if you'd like to turn there at this time, Luke chapter 16. Also... Our Father in heaven, we are thankful for this beautiful day, for the day of life that you've allowed us to see. And we're thankful, Father, that you love us and you care for us. But above all, we're thankful that we are able to assemble to worship you as you've commanded. Be with us, Father, that our mental thoughts and the things of our heart would be on the heavenly places. 
that all praise and glory would be to you who is deserving of, of everything that we can say, think, and do. Be with us, Father, as we worship. Forgive us of our sins. For this prayer we ask in Christ's name, and amen. Number 282, one, two, and fourth verse. <clears throat> I know, I know that my redeemer sing number 249, 249.
Pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, as we come before thy throne, we thank you for all the many blessings that you've given us, your providential care that we receive every day. We thank thee for this congregation. We pray that the things that are said and done this morning will be in accordance to thy will, that we may honor you, that we may glorify your name, that we may grow in knowledge of thy word, grow in love for thee and for one another, that we may be the Christians that we should be, that we may live better lives as we conduct our daily lives. Dear Heavenly Father, at this time we ask that you be with Robert Whitty's family, as comfort them as only thy can. We know that death here is only a beginning for Christians of a better life. And we always pray that we may have that comfort knowing that you will keep your promises as we've been found faithful that we will have a home in heaven with thee. We ask that you continue to be ones that have mentioned in announcements that are sick and cannot be here be with their families, be with ones that are ministering unto them, and if it be with thy will, that restore them to their natural walks of life, that they may be able to worship thee. We continue to ask that you bless the elders of this congregation, bless us in their duties and their wisdom, that they may continue to do what is right and their decisions will lead this congregation in a straight and narrow way. Be with the ones that serve as deacons, that they fulfill their responsibilities, that they do that with love for thee and for the ones that are teaching in our classrooms, that they continue to install the truth in the ones that are growing up, that they may be Christians and leaders in the church when their time comes. <clears throat> We ask that you continue to bless with Brother Tony, Brother Jason, as they bring the word, as they teach the young children, that they may be strong as they face challenges in life. We thank you for thy son through his death and the love for us that he was willing to go to the cross, that he bared our sins. We thank you for your love that you would send your only begotten son for that. We ask to continue to bless us and forgive us of our sins. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. At this time, the invitation hymn, if you want to mark that in your song books, will be 207 207. That will be after the lesson of the hour. Before we partake of the Lord's Supper, if you will, sing with me number 203. Number 203. Hallelujah. What a Savior. <clears throat> And the sorrows of the day, or the sun of the good days, through and sinners to reclaim, hallelujah, what a Savior, every 
Before we partake of the Lord's Supper this morning, I'll be reading from 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 29, if you'd like to take out a Bible and read with me. 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 29. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show that the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. If you would, go ahead now and open your communion packets for the loaf, and we will um, pray for it. Let us bow. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the many blessings you've given us. You bless us so richly. At this time, Father, we come thanking thee for allowing your son to come here upon this earth. He walked as a mortal man, endured the temptations and trials, but he was sinless. And Father, as he went to that Calvary's cross, he, he was doing that for us so that when we make mistakes or when we don't do things we should, we can get forgiveness of those sins, Father. And we pray now that as we partake of this loaf, which represents his body, may we do it in a manner that will be well-pleasing in your sight. And may we remember the sacrifice that he made for us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, if you would, please open your communion packets for the fruit of the vine. Let us pray. Like manner is loaf, Heavenly Father, now we come thanking thee for this cup, the fruit of the vine, which represents the blood that Jesus Christ shed on Calvary's cross as he hung suspended between the heavens and the earth. Father, we pray that we partake of this also in a manner well-pleasing in your sight. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, if you would, please bow with me, and we'll say a prayer for our contribution. Heavenly Father, you bless us so richly, and we have so many things here in this country that we have. We're blessed beyond measure. And, Father, sometimes we forget that all blessings truly come from you. And, Father, at this time, we now have a, a chance to give back a portion of what we've earned. And we pray, Father, that when we have the uh, opportunity as we leave, if we've not given of our means, that we will do it with an open and cheerful heart. We pray, Father, that this will be used to further spread your word and do the things that will be most needed for your, for your church here upon this earth. Heavenly Father, um, be with us and let us all do it with a cheerful heart. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Luke chapter 16, verses 23 and 24. And being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in, in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame. Before we begin our lesson this morning, let me um, first of all ask and request uh, we've had a situation where one of our city leaders has had to drop out 
And so we need uh, not city leader, center leaders. And so we need someone to volunteer. And uh, I know that many of you did not get the opportunity to volunteer. Well, now you have that opportunity. If you'll see me after services uh, and just say, I'll take care of it. I'll explain to you all that's needed. And uh, we would truly be thankful and appreciative for that. If you don't volunteer, then we will begin conscription later on the week. So, uh, but we appreciate you uh, going ahead and planning on doing that. This morning's lesson is going to be a little bit frank and forward. It's going to be uncomfortable. We're going to talk about terror in Hades. If you are not a faithful Christian, I hope you feel incredibly uncomfortable. I hope what we study makes you think. I hope that it makes you say, I've got to do something. Not tomorrow, not this evening, today. When you think about the word terror, it is a frightening thought. There's with that dread and fear and, yes, even hopelessness. In order to try to get your minds to think about some of this before we enter the text, I'd like to use a couple of recent events that perhaps could make you think about the importance of this. On June the 24th, 2021, just a little over a week ago, there were a number of people in a tower in the city of Miami. And for whatever reason, and I'm sure they will find the reason, that tower fell. And there were 24 people now who have been confirmed as dead, but there's still 121 people that are missing. I would like for you to imagine yourself being in that tower and you begin to hear the snap and the pop of the concrete as it begins to give way. And you realize my life is flashing right before my eyes. But as the concrete begins to fall and you fall into one of those crevices and you think maybe somebody can save me. But then you realize that's not going to happen. And in your mind is a certain dread, a real hopelessness of knowing you're not going to get out, that you are going to die where you are. You go back a little bit further to November the 28th, 2016. What is once referred to as the Great Smoky Mountain Fires or the Gatlinburg Fires. There were 14 people who were killed in that event. 190 were injured. We often will look at that and we'll say, boy, it, it scarred the land, but it scarred the people as well. I want you to imagine that you're on top of one of those mountains and enjoying a, a time of enjoyment with your family. And you get up and you look out and everywhere around you is fire. And you know the only way out is to go down that road upon which you came. And there's fire all the way down the road. You get in your car and you think, I'm going to make it down this road. But you realize soon, there's no place to go. Fire's everywhere. And you're going to burn to death. Now, folks, that's terror. That's dread. But that's not the worst. I'd like for you to notice with me that God, through his word, uses two different kinds of motivators for us. One of the motivators is rewards or pleasure. And when we study about heaven, I think about being eternally with God and all the joys that go along with that. That when Jesus says that where I am, there you may be also. And to think about no sickness, no sorrow, no pain. Oh, wonderful. And to be with the best people of this universe. 
But then the Bible uses punishment or pain as a motivator of something that we want to avoid. You and I ought to never even want to contemplate what it would be like to have to spend one minute in torments. And yet the Bible warns us. The Bible uses both as a means of motivation. And I'd like for the next few minutes for you to keep your Bibles open with me to Luke chapter 16. Please, I'd encourage you to do that. I want you to have it marked in your Bible. Again, as I said earlier, I want it to be something that will be a means or a motivator. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to look at three things in this text. We're going to look at a man who had everything, but he had nothing. He had it all, but he had nothing. Number two, he's a man who needed help, but he couldn't get it. And then he was finally a man for whom nothing could be done. Let's begin our exploration now in verses 19 through verse 22. Luke records the words of our Lord. There was a certain man who was clothed in purple and linen, fine linen, and fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs that, which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. Fine clothes and fancy feast. Look down at yourself for just a moment. The clothes that you're wearing. Those are nice clothes. Most of us could walk to the closet this morning and have a choice of what shirt we wanted to wear. For us men, if you're wearing a jacket, what jacket you wanted to wear. How many of those ties do I have for Father's Day? I can choose whichever tie I want to wear. Which pair of shoes am I going to wear? Ladies, what about your dresses? What about your jewelry? Dressed very well. And that's appropriate. We're here to worship the Lord. That's good. Fared sumptuously every day. I would imagine in here in about an hour and a half, most of us are going to either go home to a large meal that we have prepared earlier, which we'll have much left over, or we'll go to one of the restaurants and we'll order what food we want, as much as we want, and prepare just like we like it, and then complain about it. You see, we're so well blessed. The rich man had it all. Luke 12, verse 15, Jesus reminds us, he said, take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. The fact that you and I have good clothes and we have good food and we have it in abundance does not make us. That's hard for people to understand. It does not make us. In Ecclesiastes chapter 5, beginning with verse 10, going through verse 16, Solomon steps back and he says, look at man. And particularly man as he makes a lot of money. He said, he who loves silver will not be satisfied with silver, nor he who loves abundance with increase. This is vanity. When goods increase, they increase who eat them. So what profit have the owners except to see them with their eyes? He said, you look at Man, you never get enough. You want more. Why do you want more for it? Just so you can look at it? You get to a point where you can't spend what you've got. What are you going to do? I'm going to just keep piling up, keep piling it up. Solomon goes on to talk about it. He says that's to his hurt. But he said, you know what happens when you get to the end? He said, 
In verse 15, as I came from his mother's womb, naked shall he return. To go as he came, he shall take nothing from, you mean I can't take any of it with me? Not at all. The rich man did not take one penny with him. Not one penny. He most certainly was successful, but he was stingy. You say, what do you mean stingy? The Bible doesn't say he was stingy. Oh, yes, it does, too. It tells us about Lazarus, and it tells us what he was wanting, and it tells us where Lazarus had been placed or laid, if you will. Notice with me what Deuteronomy chapter 14 says, beginning with verse 28. At the end of every third year, you shall bring out the tithe of your produce of that year and store it up within your gates. And the Levite, because he has no portion nor inheritance with you, and the stranger and the fatherless and the widow who are within your gates may come and eat and be sat. What? Why was Lazarus laid at the gate of the rich man? Because that's where he's supposed to go. The rich man had not just enough, but he had more than enough. And all he wanted was the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table, and he didn't get any of them. I tell you, his man is stingy. When you go to the book of Amos, the prophet, chapter 6, verses 4 through 6, Amos gives us a picture, if you will, looking into the hearts of the people during that time. And listen as he says, who lie upon beds of ivory, stretch out on couches, eat lambs from the flock and calves from the midst of the stall, who sing idly to themselves or to the sound of string instruments and invent to themselves musical instruments like David, who drink wine from bowls and anoint yourselves with the best ointments. Oh boy, you've got it all, but are not grieved the affliction of Joseph. Just like the rich man sitting over, oh, I got plenty. I've got everything I need. He did not have compassion. He did not have care. He did not have concern. Those who have are expected to show compassion to those who have not. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, beginning with verse 17, going through verse 19, command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good, that they may uh, be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share. Oh, that's not the rich man. In Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 31, he who oppresses the poor reproaches his maker, but he who honors him, honors him who has mercy on the needy. 19, 17, he who has pity on the poor lends to the Lord, and he will pay back what he has given I know one thing, the rich man didn't look down and say, you know what, poor old Lazarus, the man's sick, he's got sores, the man's hungry, he needs something to eat, let me help him, and in doing so I'll give to the Lord. No, that's not what he was thinking at all. 1 John 3, 17, but whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? Riches are worth nothing in eternity. Nothing at all. Proverbs 13, verses 7 and 8. There's one who makes himself rich, yet has nothing. Well, that's exactly what I'm trying to say. You've got money, but you don't have anything. And there's one who makes himself poor, and yet has great riches. Chapter 11 and verse 4, riches do not profit in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. 
You look where the rich man went and you ask, what did he have when he got there? In Matthew 16, verse 26, what would a man be profit if he should gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Revelation chapter 3, verse 17, talking to the church at Laodicea. Because you say, I am rich and have gotten, become wealthy and have need of nothing. And do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Here's a man who had it all, but he had nothing. Let's move through the text a little further. Let's begin with verse 23 and go through verse 25. A man who needed help but could not get it. And being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember in your lifetime you received good things and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he's comforted and you are tormented. Tormented in Hades. Hades. You see, the word Hades itself means the unseen place. You don't sit with your naked eye. It's the place where the dead go awaiting the resurrection. Solomon would say that the earth, the body returns to the earth from which it came and the spirit returns to God who gave it. God has control or possession over your spirit awaiting the resurrection. And there's two different realms, two different places that a person could go awaiting the resurrection and the judgment. One is paradise. You remember in Luke chapter 23 and verse 43, the robber who was next to Jesus, who had asked him to remember him when he came into his kingdom, he said, assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Now, where was Jesus' body going to be placed? Going to be placed in the earth. Where was his spirit going? His spirit was going to go to paradise. When you get to Acts chapter 2 and Peter's preaching a sermon, he's explaining that. He says in verse 27, For you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. Two different things. The body's not going to decompose, nor is the spirit going to stay in Hades, paradise. But the other part is a place called torments. The Greek word is basanos, real unique word. To examine someone by torture, to inflict severe pain. I don't want to sugarcoat this at all. I shouldn't sugarcoat it. Don't think God would be happy if I tried to sugarcoat it. Folks, Hades, torments, is terrible. It's severe pain. When the rich man opened his eyes and he saw where he was and what he was experiencing, it was painful. I'm tormented in these flames. But let me tell you, part of the torture is the fact that he could see options and know that they were not available to him. You see, what the rich man could see afar off was Abraham and Lazarus in his bosom, and he could see the comfort that he had. Oh, can I just be there? Can I go where Lazarus is? Can I enjoy what Lazarus is enjoying? No, you can't. Do you remember Lazarus? What was Lazarus wanting? Lazarus was in the position of looking to the rich man's table and all he wanted was just the crumbs. Have you ever wanted something really badly and not been able to have it and you know the, the hopelessness of saying, 
I, I, I'll never have that. I can never attain that. It's the way Lazarus was. That's the way the rich man became. Imagine being in one of those crevices right now. After about seven days clinging to life. And you can hear ham jackhammers hammering outside and, and know that where you are, if they were able to get to you, the rest of it would collapse. You know there's help out there, but you can't have it. Here's a man who needed help but couldn't get it. Now Abraham is going to respond to the request of the rich man. You're getting what you deserve. Son, do you remember in your lifetime you received your good things and Lazarus evil things? Reaping what we sow sometimes is not very fun. Not very pleasurable. He who shows no mercy will receive no mercy. Oh, I, I don't want to be there. You're going to reap what you sow. Second thing, he says there's a great gulf fixed, rich man. Nobody on your side can come over here, and nobody over here can go to you, so just forget that idea. You can't get help like that. There's no 911. No one's coming to help. You're lost. Number three, a man for whom nothing could be done. Let's take this last section beginning with verse 26 going through verse 31. And besides all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. Then he said, I beg you therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house for I have five brothers that he may testify to them lest they also come to this place of torment and Abraham said to him they have Moses and the prophets let them hear them and he said no father Abraham but if one goes to them from the dead they will repent but he said if they do not hear Moses and the prophets Neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. Death sealed their choices. That's when you have no other choices to be made. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27, As it is appointed unto man once to die, but after that the judgment. You're going to die once. And once you die, that seals. There's no more changing of where you're going, what you're going to be, or where you're going to go. The finality of this is crushing. Because it is final. Do you remember when Paul was writing the Thessalonians? Some of them were worried about their good faithful brethren who had passed on are they going to miss the resurrection because they've died no they're not going to miss it and he's wanting to reassure them but he uses a phrase of the last part of verse 13 which is earth shattering he said I do not want you to be ignorant brethren concerning those who've fallen asleep lest you sorrow as others who have No hope. No hope. Nothing else you can do. We're talking about a man for whom nothing could be done. There's no hope there. But something could be done for his brothers. He recognizes the finality of this. I can't get any relief. I can't leave this place. Well, I don't want anybody else to come here. Father Abraham, send somebody 
Send Lazarus from the dead. Now that's a real important thought because Ecclesiastes 9 and verse 4 says, But for him who is joined to all the living, there is hope. For a living dog is better than a dead lion. That's sort of an in-your-face statement, but it's true. While you're alive, you can do something. And there's hope for you now. You know, just a few minutes, we're going to sing the invitation song. You're alive. You can make your choice. You can say, I, I've made my decision. I'm going to do it today. I'm not going to do it now. I'm not going to wait. But he protested. No, Father Abraham. He still thought his family was privileged. I need somebody to come from the dead for my family. Do you think you're privileged? Do you think some God should send someone to you personally? I'm talking about come up, call your name and say, you really need to think about what you are doing. Folks, that's what this is. They've got Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. God intended through the foolishness of preaching to save those who believe. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 21. Who would be needed to reach these brothers? Would you expect a miracle somehow to God to grab you by the collar and say, you better watch out, you're going to lose your soul if you're not careful. Romans 1 and verse 16, Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation. Why do people wait too late? I believe they don't think that this will be their last opportunity. I really think that's most people think, well, you know what, we're going to come back tonight, we're going to enjoy ice cream. You may or you may not. We'll be here Wednesday night and, and no, it'll be a little bit different. No. Everybody keeps thinking there's another opportunity, there's another opportunity, there's another opportunity. Some people believe the Lord's going to mistakenly, or they believe mistakenly, the Lord's going to change his mind. They believe he's going to be just like an old buddy who's going to say, ah, oh, don't worry about it, just come on in, come on in, you get to go to heaven anyway. I know you lied. I know you fornicated. I know you got drunk. I know you did all this stuff. Oh, just come on in. We're going to forget about all that. Is that what the Bible says? Let me tell you, tragedies strike every day. Those people who are in that tower in Miami, I'm sure, probably had some indications of, of things that were not right. But when that event happened, and people lost their lives. Doesn't matter if you're old or young, rich or poor, white or black, whatever color, whatever, it didn't matter. Tragedies happen every day. There are people who have acute illnesses. People in my family drop dead of heart attacks. You can be sitting there and the next minute you're gone. There's all kinds of accidents. You may get in the car and you may drive to the bypass and someone not stop and take you and your family out. You say, why are you being so forceful about this? Because somebody needed to have been forceful with the rich man and told him about what was in front of him. Most of us fear being trapped and in a hopeless condition. I don't want to be in a building or an area that's burning. I don't want to burn. I feel for those people who went through that in Gatlinburg. I don't want to be trapped in a building gasping for air. A car submerged in water where you can't get your breath. Oh, I don't, I don't want to go through all those things. But there's a warning about our lives in Scripture. Hell is too long and too hot and too painful for us to carelessly end up there. 
I want you to listen to two verses of Scripture, and then we're going to try to bring this to a close. Hebrews chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. Therefore we must give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest we drift away. For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and every disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? You know, the problem many are going to have is they're going to just neglect to do what they know they should have done a long time ago. What are you going to do when you open your eyes in eternity and you know you neglected to do what the Lord told you to do? You go to chapter 10 and verse 26. For if we sin willfully after we received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains any sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation. Do you get that? And fiery indignation. When you and I know what we ought to be doing and we choose not to do it, what else could God do for us? So all you got left is to expect that terror in Hades. We're going to sing the song, Hark, the Gentle Boy Calls. And I hope if you're not a Christian, that you have made your mind up to say, I am convinced that Jesus is the Christ. I'm ready to repent of my sins. I'm going to come forward. And I want to say, I want to become a New Testament Christian. I want to be baptized. And we will let you witness that good confession and be baptized for the remission of your sins. The Lord forgives you of all your sins. You are then added to his body, the church. And if you're a Christian and you need to be restored to faithfulness, we beg and we plead with you. Don't let this opportunity pass. Would you come together? We stand and sing.
final song this morning is number 694, first and last verse only. Thank you, Tony, so much for that powerful lesson this morning. If, if that should make us all look at our lives and examine the, our relationship that we have with God. Thank you so much, Tony, for that powerful lesson. We want to welcome everyone here this morning. We appreciate you being here. Especially, we want to welcome you if you're visiting with us. And remind everyone that we will have Bible classes in just a few minutes. We want everyone to take advantage of those. And to make plans now to be back this evening for our evening service where our summer series will continue. And our speaker this evening will be Derek Coble. Am I pronouncing that right, Tony? Derek Coble and his topic will be One Lord. So I know that <clears throat> we're looking forward to being back this evening to hear that good lesson from Derek Coble. Remind everyone, please remember the Weedy family in your prayers. This family is... Uh, very close, and they've been a part of us for years, so just please remember them and in your prayers and thoughts on this the time of their grievance. We need to remember all the sick in our, in our prayers and thoughts. And remember also there'll be no classes this Wednesday evening. Everyone will meet here in the auditorium, and also next Sunday morning they, everyone will meet for Bible class period here in the auditorium. And now I want to talk to you something talk to you about something that's very serious. Ice cream. <laughs> this evening we'll have our annual ice cream fellowship. And if you don't think it's serious, talk to some of these brethren <clears throat> about making their ice cream. They put these ingredients together, got to have just the right amount of this and that. If you don't think it's serious, just ask them to give you their recipe and you'll find out how serious it is. So please make plans to stay this evening after services. We always enjoy the ice cream fellowship, and the desserts will be individually wrapped for sanitary reasons. And we also need a little help this morning to get some tables out of room one and a, few, and a couple of tables from the basement. So if you can stay and help take care of that this morning for just a few minutes uh, after our services this morning, we'll <clears throat> get that ready for this evening. And also, I want to tell you that uh, this evening, whenever we get ready to serve the ice cream, the 70 years and older group will be going first. So and the reason I mention that, I'm still in the younger group <laughs> by one year. I'm still in the younger group by one year. So <clears throat> I think we'll all enjoy this evening. So uh, now we're going to sing this final hymn and be dismissed with a prayer. To Cana's land I am on my way where the soul Father, which art in heaven, we thank you for this time that you've given us this Lord's Day that we could gather together to sing praises to thy name, to come to you in prayer, and to study from your word. 
And Father, this morning, we especially as the lesson, as we, we pray that you will, it will resound with us, that it will carry it with us in our minds, and that we will share, share it with others. And Father, especially those who have not had the opportunity to hear the gospel, or, or Father, for those who have not obeyed the gospel, or, or those who have fallen away, we pray for time. We, we know, Father, that time is in your hands and that at any moment the judgment may be upon us. But, Father, we pray for that opportunity to continue to evangelize and to spread your word. We pray, Father, now that you'll be with us as we begin our Bible study period again, that we'll have opportunity to open our Bibles and study your word together, gleaning from it. Pray that you'll go with us now, God, guard, and direct us. And this is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.